hit it. It's Friday, June 3rd, 2022, episode 182. I'm Patrick Serezna. And I'm Kevin Muir. This week, Brent Kuchubo from Spot Gamma joins us to talk about the chunky option expiration we have coming up. Also, make sure you stick around for a single stock idea that definitely piqued my interest. Then Patrick has got a brand new box of crayon is, crayons and is keen on using them on talking charts. We then end with our segments of uh, No Stupid Questions and Skin in the Game. And folks, we might even drink some beers along the way. So stick around. We've got a great show. Lena, hop on. Uh, what beer am I drinking uh, this week? Um, this week, Patrick is drinking Muddy York Brewing Company's Gisela Dark Sour with Cherry. Oh, yeah. That's sour. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> It says here in tarot readings, the two of cups represents a flow of love, a strong connection or partnership. Gisela dark sour with cherry balances the roasty notes of a dark beer with the tartness of a sour ale, all wrapped up in the lusciousness of sour cherries. It's a beautiful romance between dark and roasty with tart and fruity. I'm glad. So which one of you is dark and roasty <laughs> and tart and fruity? <laughs> I'm glad I'm missing this week's beer. That's all I can say. <laughs> Um, speaking of beer, I just wanted to say a little something. This is Kevin. Um, yep. You know, I consider myself one of the luckiest guys in the world. I get to interview some of the smartest, most interesting folks in finance, all the while working with you two folks uh, who are just the greatest people a fellow could ever ask for as a partner. Um, it's a real privilege to do the market huddle each week, and I'm extremely appreciative of the opportunity. But I didn't think it could get any better until I met my other fellow headlers at our piss up. Yeah. I took my whole my thankfulness to a whole other level. I just want to say that I've never met a nicer group of people who are interested in the market. Just salt of the earth folk uh, who made for and we made for a fantastic evening. Agreed. Um, it ended up being a big group, and unfortunately, the weather didn't uh, cooperate with us, so we actually had to take it inside, and it got kind of loud. And I don't know. I tried to talk to everyone, but I know I, there were some people I missed. So if I missed you, I apologize. And I'd just like to thank you for coming out. Um, I know yeah. Patrick has a he wants to do a special shout out for those who traveled to come to see us. Yeah, I just wanted to take a moment to say that I I didn't think I could get any more thankful to, for the huddle, but I think that the folks uh, during the pits up, and actually, in fact, everyone who listens to our show, and even though you know those who couldn't come out, because obviously it's a long way for a lot of people. But uh, oh, I have the, something to say about that at, at, in the after show. Okay, well there you go. Um, <laughs> uh, but I just so, want to say that meeting the people that are listening has really changed and uh, made me appreciative. And I, I just, I'm so thankful. And I, as I say, I consider it a privilege to do this and knowing who's listening on the other end has just made me all the happier and all the more proud for doing it. Well, there you go. And I just want to do the quick little shout out. Cause it was, I was actually quite uh, uh, honored and, and uh, surprised by uh, where everyone came from to come visit. Uh, I mean, we had people uh, from the States, San Diego, New York, Chicago, uh, Ohio, Idaho, uh, and then uh, people came in from Montreal, but uh, the winners had to be, uh, we had uh, one of our listeners come in from Paris, France, and another one from Jordan. Like that's, <laughs> That's that's some serious hardcore um, yeah. uh, loyalty, uh, and it was such a pleasure meeting all of you. And I'm I'm glad you guys made the trip. It was such a pleasure. It was a great evening, and thank you for helping us drink our beers. Uh, just for uh, you know, I hate people that talk about uh, good trades after the fact, but I will say, considering this isn't really a trade, I I feel like I can tell you talk about this without the market gods getting mad at me. I called uh, if for the six o'clock was when I thought was going to be the over under for when our beer ran out. Uh, the 50 pitchers, and it was 558, Patrick. At least I gave out my last beer at 558. There you go. From the boys from Barry. For those, by the way, there's two, the boys from Barry that looks like I told them they should be on a Letter Kenny show, and they, they, they were the. <laughs> and, and, and the one boy, the one guy, well, not boy, obviously, but anyways, the boys from Barry, it just sounds with the alliteration is better. Um, but anyways, I said, the one of them asked for a beer thing, and I said, here you go. And then there was one more, and I said, I only have one more left, and the fellow had a beer. And I said, I'll give you the last one. If you drink that quick, you chug it. And he chugged it, and he was, he was my last beer, and it was 558. Okay, let me do the side, <laughs> the side effects. effects no, yeah. Nothing in this podcast should be viewed as investment advice. Listeners should consult an investment professional before making any decisions regarding topics mentioned in the show. Side effects of too much huddle may include the turtle head tush and the gamma squeeze grumpies. <laughs> I wouldn't want those last ones. Then, anyway, let's get to uh, the interview with Brent. 
It's our great pleasure to welcome back to the show Brent Kachuba. Uh, Brent is the founder of Spot Gamma, and he, it's that time of year or that time of, uh, I guess, quarter again quarter. when, uh, yeah, when uh, all of a sudden everyone's talking about the big expiry. And uh, this is going to be one that's a little bit, uh, got a little bit of new wrinkles, let's just say. That's uh, that's true. You know, not not all of the quarterly expirations uh, have significant. I mean, they're all bigger than than typical expirations, obviously. But the uh, this quarter is a, is is one of the larger ones, and and uh, not just in the opex, but also the VIX, and obviously it coincides with a very important FOMC meeting. So so there's a lot of things that could make waves uh, next week. That's that's uh, the week after. Excuse me, June thirteenth. Okay, so why don't you just tell people that are maybe just tuning in for the first time a little bit about Spot Gamma, what you guys do, and then we'll talk about how the market's setting up. Sure, thanks. So we analyze the options market and try to estimate its impact on the underlying stock. So we put out a daily note about the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ, and then we also have a bunch of tools that allow you to monitor how options may be impacting individual equities, uh, both from sort of a, a more higher level macro basis, but then also uh, in real time, uh, we have a couple of features that allow you to see uh, delta hedging impact in real time. And you also do a great YouTube uh, channel that I, I, I follow and you Oh, thank you. Brent, you, I, I don't know how you do it. You manage to get up there alone. You're like Patrick and, and do it without <laughs> without a co-host or without an interviewer. And I'm always amazed and impressed by people who can do it alone because I, I have a lot of trouble with that. Okay, so let's get to the markets because we've definitely seen an interesting time in that a lot of hedge funds are hurting. We've had a decline in the markets over the last quarter. And yet, even though this has happened, I would say that it wasn't as much kind of macro based. Uh, would you agree? Yeah, it's been a, you know, I think what the way to characterize the last few months has really been a deleveraging. I mean, uh, we saw that there was big options positions, uh, put positions come in late last year. I think that, you know, the Fed made it clear towards the end of late last year that that things were going to change. And so, you know, a lot of more astute funds, I think, were able to, to layer on some protection uh, in advance. And, and in general, I think, you know, the cost of capital has gone up. So, you know, margin rates have gone up. I think uh, there's been, a, as you mentioned, a lot of poor performance out there. And so this has been, a, I, I think, more characterized by long selling um, and slow and steady, you know, grind lower, obviously, uh, than it has been this capitulatory move, like say we got in, in March of 2020. And we haven't had a credit event either. I think a lot of people were concerned about that. Um, and again, in March of 2020, we had obviously the oil complex, you know, really implode, but, you know, Russia so far hasn't caused any problems. And, and so I think the fact that we haven't had that credit event has kept volatility pretty contained. Yeah. I think if you had told people that we would have Fang Mat exp- uh, implode like they have, if we would have had, let's say oil going to 130 bucks overnight because of the Russia Ukraine situation, I, most people would have expected VIX, uh, volatility options and and even the decline to be more uh do you have any idea was that a function of people being uh, having a lot of uh protection ahead of the fact yeah we we have a a slide on this actually and what you could see is going back to january um there was just a big put position and, and people were not really reaching out to grab calls either and so there was there was sort of the the desire for upside activity or upside action seemed to to just recede right and there was a lot of interest in in big put positions and the and some of these players are uh you know the big funds the bridgewaters of the world are doing their you know quarterly rolling regardless they're always there right but but there was clearly this uh move to hedge and and when i say that i look at the put position in the sp 500 and then also in vix call options uh we have vix call positions that are as high as they are as they were going back again to march of 2020 so i think people and traders were well prepared for this um, and, and that is why it's been sort of this, you know, again, as I mentioned before, this grind lower as opposed to this jump, you know, where you get kind of a, a limit down, you know, capitulation type move. Okay. So let's go through, then we have, uh, this positioning. And as you mentioned, it's going to be one of the larger opexes that we had. Uh, why don't you walk us through the timing, how it's going to evolve and what we should be watching for the first slide here. I see, as you say, the week of June 13th is the one to watch. I guess we still have a, a week to prepare. And, right. and why is that? So on, on 6.15, we have a very large VIX expiration. We quantify that uh, in, in a few slides. So that so that happens on uh, the morning of 6.15. So at 9 a.m. is the VIX expiration. That's when the settlement takes place. And then later that afternoon, obviously, you have the FOMC. And, and you know, everybody's watching the FOMC to figure out 
uh, you know, what the next move is going to be, obviously. And then two days after that, we have a very large uh, options expiration. So that's the single stocks as well as the index options all expire uh, on the 17th. And so um, these are put heavy op, uh, expirations, both in terms of the VIX, which is kind of an interesting dynamic here. And then also in terms of equities, uh, there's just a much heavier put uh, uh, side of the equation here than calls as we march into that 617 day. Now, I've noticed a lot of people talking about, or option experts at least, talking about how the VIX expiration really matters. And I don't think that a lot that anyone, at least that I've seen, has explained it really well and and really hammered down why that actually what that means and why that ends up being an event. Do you do you have any kind of insights or something you could share with us of why the regular Joe that might just be trading SPX options should be watching the VIX expire? Yeah, I think these last couple of VIX expirations have been. Uh, more impactful than, than than typical, you know, than, than you typically see, say, last year, and that is because the sort of the state of volatility markets is just elevated. Obviously, if the VIX up around thirty and options vol- values are elevated, you know, realize volatility is up around twenty five to thirty, and so just the value of options and and just kind of the Vega complex, I guess I would say, is amplified, and a lot of that ties back into the VIX expiration, and and this is a very interesting. You know, ten day period here uh, because the VIX, uh, the front month VIX uh, future expires before the FOMC, right? So that's not pricing in the FOMC at this point. So we arguably have say ten days now of opportunity for you know uh, short term or more speculative traders to come out and sell vol, right? Um, and that front month future has to expire wherever the VIX is as those two settle. And so with this more amplified VIX complex, what we've seen the last two VIX expirations, that's in uh, uh, April and, and May, uh, there was a big rally on the Tuesday before uh, VIX expiration. A, a rally in VIX or a rally in the market? Rally in the markets, right. Yep. And, and it corresponded with just kind of this crush in volatility. And I think a lot of what that is, is, you know, there's there's obviously a big role, right? So we have kind of a big contango now between where the front month feature is going to be uh, and then, you know, where that back month feature is going to be, because the back month feature for VIX is obviously going to be pricing in the FOMC at this point. And the same thing with the w- with options of any kind here at this point, um, that there is this weird contangle where we can sort of suppress front month volatility or, or pre event vol, pre FOMC event vol. Uh, but that longer dated vol is going to hold that. Uh, I keep calling it event volatility, right, of the FOMC. Um, and so there's there could be this really weird action where we get another sort of rally in April and May. We saw a two percent rally on the Tuesday before VIX expiration. So if you want to trade the VIX expiration contracts, you do that on Tuesday because those VIX index options don't settle or don't trade on on the Wednesday morning, even though VIX settles at at nine a.m. Eastern on uh, on expiration day. Okay, so we should, we should be watching for the VIX the day before VIX expiration. Now the next slide I see here is that you have is why OPEX matters, and you go through. Yeah. And you show some uh, rather dramatic uh, turning points, let's just call them, in the markets that, that coincided with uh, OPEX. Yeah, we've covered this, uh, you know, with you uh, actually several times over the over the years here. And and so some of you are going to be familiar with this chart. But basically what it shows is how there are major turning points or major market moves tied to particularly these quarterly expirations. And I think the interesting takeaway here is, you know, the, the Monday after uh, the COVID crash, right, uh, in March, uh, the third expiration, uh, excuse me, the third Friday of March was a big options expiration. This is back in March of 2020. The Monday after was a huge market rally. Same thing in December of 2018. You know, there's a famous incident of Mnuchin calling the banks, right? And, and yeah. saying uh, Christmas Eve. Well, that Christmas Eve was the Monday after options expiration. Um, interestingly, you know, this past January, we had a really big options expiration. And that was a large options expiration because a lot of traders, they trade leaps. And uh, when you buy those January calls, say for next year, and the market rallies 20, 30, 40%, right? Like it has been, those call options gain, you know, massively in value. And so those expirations that this past January and last year's options expiration um, were both very large because there was a bunch of deep in the money calls that expired. I think that one of the things that's lost is, or, or that was so interesting is a small segue here is all that January of 2021, you know, uh, GameStop meme mania, right? All that occurred right on, January options expiration when there was humongous uh, in the money calls that are all expiring. And that caused, I think that really exacerbated the, the volatility there. Uh, but now, I, 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 it's funny you mentioned leaps because I said that the other day and people looked at me funny. They didn't know what a leap was. Are they still, <laughs> are they still called leaps? I think they are, you know, and, and 
it's it's interesting because Nancy Pelosi's kind of made those famous. I mean, you know, that's what that's what she buys and people come out. Oh, she bought a whole bunch of tech stocks and and she'll put four or five million bucks in, in you know, Roblox calls or whatever it is. And, and that trade has worked very well for her over the time. There's sites that track that activity now and all that. But but a lot of those wealth advisors like those longer dated calls because it gives you leverage. Right. You have fixed right. risk and it gives you some leverage if you think that there's going to be, you know, an extended move. Uh, for, yeah. for for those who don't know the the leaps, do you know what it stands for? I can't remember, Brent. Long something, uh, equity, long equity appreciation. <laughs> I, I don't know, know. but it, it's 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 the reason why when you look out, you'll see that there's always a January expiry that's uh, out a couple of years, and those were the original leaps. And long term essence, equity anticipation securities. I there you go. There you go. It's kind of a ridiculous uh, name for them. It was just they're just in essence long dated options. Right. And it, and for those who uh, are old, like I didn't think you were that old, Brent, to remember leaps. But anyways, maybe people still call them that. But they are longer term, and there is a, a, a January. So as Brent kind of highlighted there, for those who just want to understand, the January expiry because of the leaps end up being uh, or the op- option expiry ends up being bigger than some other. Uh, let's just say a February because there's no leap uh, expiries. At that exactly. Time. exactly. As you go farther uh, on time, there's fewer expirations. And so if you want to bet on a longer term Google move or Apple move, you, you got to play the January OPEX because that's that's really the only one. So, you know, January of 2023. And, and one of the reasons that Nancy Pelosi's husband loves them is that uh, you can buy them and there's the theta monster doesn't get you quite as bad. That's right. But you do have, for those that are interested, you do have a lot of Vega risk, meaning that as volatility, implied volatility goes up or down, it it moves that option all the more. So in the past, we've had nothing but increasing volatility, or at least in the recent past, we've had mostly increasing volat- implied volatilities. But uh, I think that the, maybe there'll be a time when people learn about the Vega monster as well. Okay, let's go on to the next slide here, SPX call versus put deltas. And how you're saying, is this what you were mentioning earlier about the max puts? Yeah, that's exactly right. So here's basically just a ratio of call delta to put delta. So the the lower the green line is on this chart, the the larger the put delta complex is or put delta side of the equation is versus calls. And so as you can see here, there there's this lower bound in this model. And that lower bound coincides again with the January of, uh, excuse me, December 2018, uh, March of 2020, and all the way back into some of the other major risk events like August of 2015. So there's this idea that basically, you know, th- there's a, a max risk, I believe, across the street, right? Uh, there's a there's a max capacity for risk across all the banks, et cetera, and, and sort of a max size of position they want to put on. And, and I think in this situation, we hit that lower bound. As you can see, that green line jumped down in January of 2022, indicating that that the street had a huge put position on, you know, almost instantaneously. Uh, in January. And that and that position has by and large stayed here, you know, through these cascading of events of of geopolitical uh, and, you know, monetary fiscal changes, etc. So, uh, again, it's sort of a well hedged, a signal the market is well hedged. And it's not just hedged in the actual Delta, you know, SPX deltas, but also in the VIX, which is That's the right. implied. Why don't we go to this next slide and here you talk about how there's some large VIX call positions out there. Yeah, that's right. So on the, on this top chart here, there's a dark blue line, which is the the, the top line at the, on, on the top chart. And basically what it shows is VIX call open interest is as high now as it was in sort of the peak of March of 2020, which was obviously just this outlier event. And it's also interesting because, you know, March of 2020 was just a, you know, that felt like a, a much more challenging period. I mean, there's a lot of you know, strife and, and bad things happening, but that you know that was peak insanity. I think. In yeah, a lot not of only that, the market was moving in terms of the actual realized vol was infinitely, well, not infinitely, but much larger than what we're seeing now. That that you're you're 100 right there, and 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 I this is also sort of why what I brought up the idea of of credit risk. I mean, you know, it wasn't just the energy complex. I think that was leading the storm of of businesses, you know, maybe shutting down. But you know, at some point, if you think that a, a companies are going to go bankrupt, you just start to buy puts, right? Or you just start to buy S&P puts, maybe not because you want to, but just because you have to, because default risk has surged, right? And and you look at credit default swaps and all that. And and so in this case, you know, the VIX call positions are nearly as high as that time or that event, which again tells us, look, people are are want upside convexity, right? Or, or excuse me, tail convexity, right? They want protection in case the market uh, really drops. 
And what's also equally interesting here is there's not an equivalent pickup, or at least there hasn't been a pickup in VIX put options or VIX put open interest, meaning that the other thing that's interesting here is I don't, we don't have that sort of reflexive volatility selling response, right? That reflexive buy the stock dip now uh, that was just a feature of markets for the last two years, certainly post uh, post the, the the March 2020 episode. So, you know, that buy the dip mentality is gone, but there's also not just this interest to sort of be short vol or short convexity. And I, and I guess to some extent, that's a, a function of, I'm just looking at your chart and trying to figure out when it occurred. And it definitely seemed to start in terms of the put open interest. It started to decline into the GameStop mania. Mm -hmm. And I guess it's just gone sideways. And in the meantime, we've had the call open interest going more. And and to me, that looks like, could that be Russia, Ukraine worries and geopolitical strife? And then uh, the, yeah. Fed, the Fed raising rates so, like, yeah, there's a lot to be worried about. Yeah. I, and and well, that's what another thing that's really fascinating to me is that the actual intraday high of VIX uh, was the day of the of the Russia invasion. I believe it was February 24th. And I think the VIX put in an intraday high of 38. And I don't think we've broken that since, uh, despite sort of an escalation of, you know, uh, of, of violence and, and, and more uncertainty. And, and the move index, right, the, the index of the bond VIX, so to speak, kept marching higher. And, and the equity positions just, you know, the equity vol just sort of stayed. Uh, obviously, as you realize, it creeped up, but but implied vol, it's been fairly capped, right? I mean, we we the VIX hasn't really surged um, and held this thirty area uh, really throughout this whole quarter or, or half year. You know, it's interesting you mentioned the move, and uh, I, I do agree that that is one of the interesting parts of this recent development. Let's just say of the last year, even mm -hmm. uh, we've had a situation where interest rate vol has been much more interest uh, uh let's just say exciting and mm -hmm. and moving a lot more than equity vol it, it was was that would that be something that you think can continue or do you think it's about to uh uh return to a more normal level like i realize you don't do interest rate vol but <laughs> what, did, did that surprise you let's just put it that way yeah, I, I think I, I for sure was anticipating, you know, with the escalation of of not only the Russia tensions, but you, you also had, you know, China shut down again. Right. And and, yeah. I, and there was a sort of, again, these cascading events that if you if you were to sit there and tell me, OK, you know, X, Y, Z are about to happen, you say, OK, we're, we're going to get this sort of capitulatory move. But again, we just saw these. The, the, there was never sort of a let up in the existing put position or, or the hedge position in the market. Um, and that's what was so fascinating is, is, yes, this time is different from a lot of other events. Uh, I thought that there would be more sort of credit risk in the market. I, I thought that the move index spiking like this was a signal that there would be more credit events basically taking place, be it you know spreads blowing out and the like. And that would certainly trigger that capitulatory you know, market move down or VIX sort of, you know, 50, 60 in that, again, if we're well hedged here, but suddenly you think there's about to be mass defaults, well, then you, you have to go and buy more protection, right? And, and that may uh, that may reach people to trade up or, or seek more protection than, than they already had. Uh, and for those that are interested, actually, a lot of the VIX traders end up being credit folk because VIX ends up being very correlated to uh, credit risk. So you'll get, even though the, a lot of people assume that it's equity folks that are trading the 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 VIX, often it's not. There's a lot of of different guys and bond right. guys in there, Insurance and companies, and mm -hmm. it, yeah, it ends up being a, a almost the the uh, the professionals market, the professionals market about uh, ab option market. Yeah, yeah, uh, that's a, that's a great point, and and to your point, you know, it's it's very liquid. It's easy to access, uh, and if you think a company's about to go belly up, well, you know, you you probably want to own some puts on it, right? Uh, yeah. Or if you're exposed to that, you want to own puts, or or you want to own vex and get that 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 convexity again in your portfolio to to hedge that tail move. So why do you think we? didn't get the capitulatory move that we were expecting. Do you think it's a function of the, the way that the option market was set up in that? Well, let's just say March, 2020, we had all these dealers that were short gamma and made everything worse. And in this case, they would often be long gamma or at the very least not short as much as they should be. Yeah. Is, is, was that kind of the tail that was wagging the dog and the difference between these two periods? Yeah. yeah I, I think that, it's a, it's a function of a few things. One, again, I think because this is a deleveraging event and, and a lot of it is 
is the macro environment. You know, I think it was well forecasted what was about to happen. And, and people are selling out longs as opposed to looking to hedge their portfolio. You know, I think people's portfolio and, and the capital they have available is just shrinking in this case, as opposed to saying, look, I want to maintain my long short book, but I just need extra hedges on the downside. So I think that mitigated some of the, you know, again, that grab for for out of the money puts, which would certainly spite the VIX a little bit more. But I also think if you just consider dealers positions, you know, in general, they're going to be short sort of at the money puts, right? But they need to own tail risk. Like de- dealers cannot uh, be short puts, right? If the market goes down 7% and, and VIX goes to 100, they'll get blown out of the water, right? So they need to own a lot of that convexity themselves, right? Those out of the money puts that that kept up when there's right tail risk or excuse me, left tail risk. And so I think in that situation, when the VIX starts to lift up, the, the dealers are actually making money off of their tail hedges, right? Out of these out of the money options. And because VIX doesn't recede, you know, those options are arguably are holding some value and that allows them to provide more liquidity to the market. So it actually sort of supports the market. The, the, the more vol sort of went up, I think the more liquidity they could arguably offer um, in those situations. And so I think that's the dynamic at play again, that, that the market never really demanded more put protection. It, it didn't want to sell put, put, put protection, um, but you know that was enough, right? The, the, the street was full of, of downside protection and, that, and they've held that and they've maintained that position really throughout, again, throughout this year. So you mentioned the dealers can't sell the really far out of the money put uh, protection. Who ends up selling that? Like who, who, who's on the other side of those trades? I mean, I think it's a good question, and it also ties back into a lot of what I think there's big asset managers, you know, and and um, and insurance companies and the like who are maybe they're trading, you know, swaps of various types, which which offer longer dated, uh, longer dated volatility exposure, and so you know, it's a surface right that that's being traded. It's not necessarily, uh, you know, just this dynamic of short at the money and, and long out of the money. Uh, but I, I think there are still a lot of people who are willing to to provide that protection. Um, in and amongst themselves. So, you know, it, it, it's a fair question. I just think a lot of it sets off between the VIX complex and the S&P and, and equities at large. Yeah, I, I know that up here in Canada, there's uh, a few pension funds that will sell that volatility. And I'm just wondering if they're, that strategy is getting more popular and it's helping out, um, especially after COVID settled down and we had a situation where we looked at the people who hung tough and, and, and continued to sell it. It maybe was just one of these things where it ended up being reflective and that it worked for them post the COVID period and they've continued to do it. And to some extent, that's kind of a reminiscence of the whole Volmageddon, right? Because at that point, they people were just kept selling it because it worked. Yeah. And it just continued and continued and continued until it didn't work and it blew up large. Okay, so let's go to the next thing here. Options fatigue ahead of the FOMC. What is, what's this chart showing? Yeah, so this this shows just put volume and call volume uh, for the stocks in the S&P 500. So this is all 505 stocks, I guess it is, in the S&P 500. And what you see here, what's been so curious to me, you know, obviously we had fairly high put volumes, uh, particularly into the end of, of May, as you can see. But the month of May, um, even though markets were, were up here, there, there was not a pickup in call buying. And there was actually a big decline in put buying or put volume, I should say. And so what's so interesting to me about that is the fact that we look for call volumes to pick up as a sign that there could be an extended market rally. And and that's not just from a sentiment perspective. We think that as calls are added at higher strikes, it it allows dealers to kind of keep having to buy, right? It's kind of the gamma squeeze or just the gamma trade just in general. Um, And so that's an extent, that's an idea that the market is supporting you know, a rally or the options market supporting a rally. And in here, what it seemed like was put buyers just sort of said, look, we're, we're, we're just exhausted or the market is fatigued in general and the options volume has, has really subsided a lot. And I think this also ties into a lot of these liquidity measures that people are focused on, on now, like, you know, the E-mini top of book is a, is a chart that's making all the rounds now. And that liquidity is so poor. And then typically around this uh, Memorial Day holiday, right, that, that sort of brings liquidity down even more as traders are on vacation and the like. And and now we're getting a lot of crazy moves, right? Like at the end of last week, we had a 6% uh, rally, right? Last week in the S&P. And then yesterday was another kind of 2% up day. And, and now we gave it all back today. So um, we're getting these extra big moves. Uh, and I think that's just a function of liquidity and, and volume drying up, um, not just in the equity market, but also in the options market uh, ahead of FOMC. So now we're going to talk about this week coming up or this next two weeks coming up and the fact that we're going back to the 
VIX implosion, but now this, or sorry, the VIX expiry, but now you have a chart here that's the VVX implosion. First of all, <laughs> what is what is VVX measuring? Uh, VVIX is basically the VIX. It's a VIX of the VIX. So the VIX measures volatility, let's say, in the S&P 500, and the VVIX measures basically the, the same volatility or measures uh, is the same measurement in the VIX index itself. So a lot of people call it the vol of vol index. And what's so interesting here is that over the last uh, really two weeks, the, the VIX has broken, I guess, uh, you don't want to use technical analysis. It enrages a lot of people on, on the VIX, but <laughs> it's broken the 100 level. And it's basically back to where it was pre-March of 2020, uh, pre-pandemic, right? And so what's so interesting about that is that, again, like the VIX is very high. Yes, the VIX has come down from 30 down to about 25 as we as we talk here. Uh, but what this is really saying is that there there isn't this grab for uh, more VIX call options at this point, right? Uh, volatility a la the VIX has been pretty stable. So the volatility of the VIX has not been that high. And there isn't this demand for out of the money VIX options is really what this is telling you. So again, the market is well hedged, but just like that last slide was showing put volumes are coming down. It's kind of the same thing, thing here. This is kind of an indication that, that that there's just not this demand for tail risk at this point. Like everyone has their hedges and now it's just like, you know, let's let's wait for the main event, right? Now, do you think though that that uh, those uh, that those puts and those tail hedges are going to come off, come expiry, and therefore we're going to see something uh, dramatic kind of uh, on the, the the fourth week of June in terms of people having to buy protection again? Yeah, it's there's some path dependency here. I think to to how strong the you know of a of a rally there could be based on this expiration, um, and. And I don't think that people are going to remove put protection here and not roll it forward. So, so what I expect to see happen is, yes, you're going to get a bunch of puts expire uh, and VIX calls expire, right? But that those positions are going to be rolled forward. I mean, you know, everyone talks about again about the JP Morgan quarterly roll that's going to take place on the 30th. There's a lot of other entities that are doing the same thing, right? They need to maintain protection. And you know, uh, you're the you're the macro guru here. I don't I don't think there's uh, other than the Fed saying, hey, we're going to cut today or we're going to tell you exactly what we're doing for the rest of the year. I think th there's so much uncertainty in that macro environment that, that people are going to want to maintain some, some hedges, right? Yeah. Now you mentioned the JP Morgan uh, option whale. Uh, that was something that was just talked amongst uh, you option, uh, you know, gurus for a while there. And uh, now it seems like everyone knows about it and everyone's front running and trying to think about it. Do you, uh, do you think that it's a situation where they're actually better off having everyone know about it because it makes people compete on the price the other way? <laughs> I don't think there's any value to having people know what you're going to do. I, 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 no, no, like I, don't. I don't think this is like a, I can remember there was a, there was a big ETF allocator that I used to deal with back when I was broker and, and it started to come up on CNBC when they were doing their rebalances. Right. And, and eventually that, that volatility just leads to something breaking. And, and I think sort of a disadvantaging, Right, them when they're trying to get their trades on. Um, I think this is why most funds want to do stuff kind of in the middle of the night. Yes, you may get like a a a, a Bill Ackman type who who will talk up a stock as he's kind of getting into it because he's trying to you know directionally move things. Um, but you know, I'm not so sure that from a volatility perspective that anyone's really cutting the J.P. Morgan fund a break uh, by trying to front run you know some of their moves. <laughs> I think it it probably just costs them a little bit. And if nothing else, it it invokes a lot of volatility on that day, which um, you know gets it trickier to to for, you know for nice tight spreads and and uh, and efficient execution. Well, in the very least, I would I, I would kind of agree with you that the J.P. Morgan, for example, might be better off dividing it up into five days. And not trying to have put the plug in and demanding all that liquidity at one point, but I do notice in that vein that they've they've changed their funds so that it used to be only quarterly, and now it's either become so popular or they are switching it. It's now monthly. Mm -hmm. So we're getting we're getting a situation where not only do we have the J.P. Morgan month end effect occurring on the quarterly rebalanced uh, months, we're now getting it on the monthlies. Yeah, and and, uh, and and I think that you know that certainly allows I think not only them to 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 trade more efficiently, but also you know the broker just has to take on you know quite a bit less risk, and I think that just makes it arguably you know more efficient for uh, for the brokers who are who are trying to provide that liquidity as well. Not not that anyone wants to do them favors, but um. but as an aside, have you noticed uh, an increase? Uh, you know, as you stare at the the data of 
uh, funds willing to trade or wanting to trade month end product as opposed to the regular traditional quarterly exp- or uh, third Friday expiry. Cause it's always struck me as if I was on the buy side and I was, uh, you know, using these as an end user, that it would make a lot of sense to not sometimes actually, you know, I'm benched to the quarter end or the month end. Why wouldn't I trade an option based upon that point? It. Yeah, you bring up a good point. I think, you know, we're talking to some people from the SIBO and they were kind of, you know, pushing that idea a little bit as well. And I think it's one of those things where people get, you know, the third Friday, there tends to be still so much liquidity that, um, <clears throat> that, that you could do it there, I think for sure. Um, and, and the, and the exchanges are, are trying to constantly push out more expirations, uh, and more ways to trade and, and, and more ways to, um, uh, you know, to hedge your portfolio, I guess is what they would say, or, or more ways to, to manage your risk. And, and I think some of the issues is there's so many expirations now, you know, that whether you source liquidity from a broker on, on a, you know, on a month end basis or using the, the quarter end, I mean, I, I think it is a little bit more efficient when you're trying to get your trade on, but, you know, there's there's transaction costs there obviously involved as well. And and operationally, it, it can be just a little more daunting, I think, to, to try to manage that as opposed to sort of just rolling once a quarter and keeping it a little more. Clean. Yeah. And I, I kind of I can see that as well. Now, one of the things you mentioned that you talked to the SIBO and and they've recently gone, what, to every single day, every day. expires. Mm-hmm. So what? give me your thoughts, color on that, what you think about that. I think that it it opens up a lot of jump risk in the market, and and what I mean by that is that on on any given day, I think what that shortest dated options flow is typically doing it's 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 often volatility sellers. I think is if I had to categorize it as as one type of trade, I think there's a lot of you know sophisticated retail or just retail in general, and I think there's obviously some professionals that are doing it. But you know the idea is that these short dated options, the daily expirations have a little bit of extra vol premium, right? And and maybe you can try to extract that. Um, via, via shorting these options. But in general, what I think it, all these extra options do is it, it, it invokes this jump risk, right? Because if there is any kind of a move, yes, that that short dated volatility selling or the same day volatility selling should suppress volatility, right? But if there's any kind of a, a quick move, right, that, that can lead to a, a quick cover, right? That can that can force the leverage that people are, are using against them uh, and, and lead to the situations where uh, kind of the distribution of, of moves shifts dramatically uh, because of this scramble to cover, right? If there is a, a pretty decent move. So um, there hasn't been a big uptake, I would say, in the Tuesday and Thursday expirations so far. Uh, Friday remains to be, you know, the big, a bigger expiration also because that's when equities expire. But I, I think that there's an embedded, you know, layer of risk. Um, again, like a vol of vol is higher because of, uh, because of these same day expirations. You know, Wall Street never goes and puts the the short term profits of an exchange or a broker ahead of the long term health of the market. <laughs> so, very surprised to hear you think that. Um, okay, let's go to the next slide here. VIX EXP clearing. What what are you what are you showing here? What is this? So we we talked before about how the VIX expiration uh, could impact markets, right? And so this was the April and May expirations, and, and I highlighted on here the two percent move that we saw on the Tuesday before. The VIX expiration. So again, VIX expires oh, at okay. 9 a.m. or settles at 9 a.m. on Wednesday. And so what's so in, been so interesting in this in this kind of, again, like a Vega heavy environment that uh, there's been this trade to really pound volatility on that Tuesday before. And it, it's been funny because a lot of people will sort of scratch their heads. Why is the market up 2 percent? And they'll and they'll pull out these, you know, kind of bizarre, you know, narratives, you know, about something happening in, in China or some, you know, whatever else it may be, right? And, and instead you have this very clear uh, reaction in the volatility complex to to the VIX expiration. And so this is going to be obviously this upcoming expiration uh, on the 15th is a little bit more nuanced because you had the Fed. But, but if you do see kind of this rally on Tuesday and this unexplained rally on Tuesday, don't give it a lot of weight because it could just be simply related to uh, the clearing out of some rather large positions related to uh, the VIX index options. Why do you explain to people what you mean when you say like a, a Vega or a Vanna rally in the stock market from this uh, VIX trade? Yeah, so there's a, a a link between implied volatility or volatility in in the price of the S and P 500. So you know the VIX is calculated from the price of S and P options, and so there's an inherent link between you know again the S and P and the VIX. And the general idea is that if if dealers are uh, short put options in the S and P 500, um, 
if volatility expi- uh, spikes, if implied volatility spikes, that means those put options are worth more. And so dealers will have to add on extra short hedges to maintain, right? So if the market goes down, dealers have to sell futures. And if vol spikes, all else equal, they also have to get more hedges, right? And, and that can mean selling more futures or you know some other portfolio adjustments. And so in a similar fashion here, if traders start to sell the VIX, right? If VIX starts to drop, well, that cycles back into the S&P 500, right? That crushes put values or crushes implied volatility in the S&P. And that could lead to dealers wanting to buy back futures. And I think that that's kind of the you know the 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 basic relationship here to think about, and it can not only be dealers. There are vol funds, obviously, as you mentioned. There's a lot of different entities that are trading the VIX, and I think that you can even tie this into um, some of the behavior in the SPX and Spider options on that Wednesday uh, on the on the Tuesday and Wednesday expirations. Right, you can see those being used as as tools, oftentimes, or, or I don't want to say manipulated, but traded in a certain way that just seems to be uniquely related to uh, to these VIX expirations. I see. I love your comment where you said uh, people come up with strange reasons why the market rallied, not realizing that it was just the selling of the VIX that caused the market to to uh, to rally hard. The other one that uh, we talked about, the Vanna effect of a change of volatility. The other one is the charm effect, which is a change of time. And you did such a great job with the Vanna. I'm going to let you explain to people what the charm is and why you might often get in front of a long weekend, a big rally into the close. Yeah. So the, the charm effect is is related to theta or decay. So again, if if we're if we're dealers and we're short a bunch of put options, uh, we'd be short futures against that position, right? And as the market, uh, as each day towards expiration, uh, those put options lose value, right? All else equal through decay. You know, every day that you want to put, if your put expires at uh, next Friday, every day that passes, that put loses value, and that allows you to buy back futures if you're if you're a dealer, right, or or a hedger, and so that's kind of the the general effect. So so charm measures again the the delta related to that time decay, um, and so again based on how we believe dealers are positioned as time decays, and this relates to you know that big uh, options expiration opex on uh, the seventeenth. There are big put positions there, right, and as we kind of march ahead those put options are decaying. I think that's a good part of what's providing some lift to markets here. Uh, both the Vanna trade because of the VIX and implied volatilities come back down, but also these these big put positions are burning up as, as time marches on and as the market rallies. That's, that, it's all been, I think, supportive, right? Those flows have been supportive of markets over the last uh, week or two. So Brent, in my day when I was in the 90s and I was trading index options for uh, for a bank, we used to go on Friday at lunch, we used to push our head our our calculator in essence to to Saturday. And in our day, it was uh, sure it changed our pricing of our model and it, it affected the prices that we would trade out on the, on the board, but it wasn't big enough to affect the actual markets itself. And although I kind of understood at the time that, that you needed to, because there was a weekend and you wouldn't have a, the chance of, a, of as much of a move. And therefore uh, a Saturday is not the same as a Thursday, for example, when it comes to option trading, I never imagined back then that it would be moving the actual markets. I, I find that fascinating that these positions are large enough that they move the markets through that, that Vanna and especially that charm. And I see it time occur time and time again, Brent, where you get a long weekend and there's that extra day of, of charm and the market closes the Friday out at the highs and everyone's confused about it. And I just yeah. say, it's the same thing. It's those guys. It's the, it's cause like the reality, the other thing about it is that if you're a dealer, you don't buy in the morning, you buy towards the end of the day. Right. And not only that, all the real clowns are gone. So there's no offerings. It's very thin, which just makes it all the worse. And then you sometimes when you get a little bit of charm, you also get then some Vanna because the vol comes down as we go through. Anyways, yeah, uh, I'll stop rem- reminiscing and uh, boring you with old stories. Let's go to the next slide here. The You're talking about the VIX expiry again on June 15th and the fact that there are these large positions. Why don't you kind of highlight to us which ones they are and what it, why they matter? Sure. So this chart breaks out. Uh, we, we measure this on VIX delta. So we just look at the delta of the VIX options in this case. And, and we think it's a nice way of just showing how large uh, this upcoming expiration is versus um, some of the, uh, the the longer data expirations or the, you know, the expirations at longer dates. And, and what you may notice here is there's a fair amount of calls expiring, but there's also a very big VIX put position expiring. And so if you bring up a, a broker's platform and you look at this, you can see there are hundreds of thousands of puts at each strike, basically from 26 on down to 20. And we believe that is 
put in something of a lower bound for for the VIX and volatility here as we as we push towards FOMC um, because of those big positions. You know, this could be sort of a, a kind of a max pain scenario, right? Where there's some big call positions, decent sized call positions at 30 and above, but there's just these really chunky big. VIX put positions. And I think that if you look at a chart of the VIX over the last you know, week or two, uh, it tests that 25 area, right? But, but it has some buoyancy there, uh, even though the market kind of seems to continue higher. And I think a lot of that is related uh, to these big, big VIX puts that are, that are set to expire uh, on the 15th. All right. And then the next slide here is the OPEX. And we again have some chunkiness there. Why don't you tell us what's going on there? Yeah. And, uh, this is actually incorrectly the bows of VIX, so I apologize for this. But this is the uh, this is an aggregation of the SPX, the spiders, and the Qs. So the three big uh, dominant index ETF positions, and you can see that uh, there there are some fairly large call positions there in blue. But that that teal colored bar are these really big put positions that are set to expire. And I mentioned before that there's a little bit of path dependency here. I think if the market rallies up into uh, the 4300 area into that options expiration, that 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 the market could then mean revert and, and trade lower after that options expiration, and, and vice versa. If we're if we're down around say four thousand into FOMC and OPEX, I think those puts that expire could create a real lift in the market, uh, and that's a function again of these dealer hedges unwinding uh, into and around FOMC. So you know, obviously this feels like it's a little more of an important FOMC, and there's a little more uncertainty around what to expect. But historically, what happens is the FOMC comes out, the Fed says it's bit. And vol just in general shifts down, right? The, the whole kind of volatility complex, you know, just takes a deep breath or, or a sigh of relief as, you know, no major uh, a trigger comes out of what the Fed says. And I don't know, obviously, if, if this case is going to be different, but generally the FOMC will kick off this this volatility unwind, right? Um, and, and you kind of have to assign edge to that because historically that's what happens. I mean, you look at the rally that we had in March, it actually started right around the FOMC uh, on a Wednesday and that just fed right into OPEX, right? We basically used up all that OPEX fuel in like a, a 10% rally over just a few days. Uh, and that created a big air pocket down underneath, right? Because it's the short covering fuel. It's it's volatility unwind. It's dealers closing, closing hedges related to long puts. Uh, and, and that could be a catalyst for a, for a pretty sharp market rally. And that's something of a position that we're looking at here. Uh, coming up into the 17th. Right. And uh, the fact that the 15th, you told us the 15th is the VIX expiration and we should, the, the day before we got the kind of the selling of that. And then we have the FOMC, the next, like it could be actually, even though all the news is bad, there's all sorts of reasons why the market should head lower. It would yeah. almost be interesting if we had a big rally into almost like a, a sell the news by the, by the, or sorry, sell the rumor by the news kind of event. Yeah. And, and I think if you're if you're bearish, you, you almost want this kind of rally, right? Because this this is going to clear out a lot of those put positions that we were talking about before. It's going to clear out a big you know part of the VIX complex, and so you know that would mean that the market is somewhat going to be arguably under hedged, right? Or certainly the hedging positions are going to be fewer. And so as traders roll into new hedges, you know that creates downside demand, right? That that sort of reverses the that positive van of flow, like it shifts you know shifts it around on its head a little bit, such that as traders demand put options, volatility spikes up, right? Increases, uh, you know, which kicks off this sort of reflexive cycle, right? Because higher implied vol means puts are worth more, which means dealers got to sell more futures. And so there, there are these relationships um, that are just related to positioning. And I think, you know, I, I've sort of talked about this idea that there's technical, technical analysis and there's fundamental analysis, but there's there's also positional analysis. And I think um, that's really what the all this sort of options analysis is about is what are the positions and and what can we extract from that right and when should these flows uh be impactful now fa that's fascinating stuff now you don't just do positional analysis you also um have a new product called your what your hero is that what you call it so yeah, it's got yeah. an eye it's got an eye it's h-i-r-o <laughs> but we still call it the hero tell us yep. a little bit about it what you're trying to do what you're uh, learning from it and how uh, people are using it yeah, thanks. So what the HERO system does, it stands for the hedging impact of real-time options. And, and basically what that means is we watch every single option trade coming into the market in all three or 4,000 different uh, equities and indices. And we are measuring the dealer hedging impact, right, of all of those trades. And the idea is that when there's a big spike in, say, call volumes in a mean stock or traders are, are buying or selling puts in the spiders, uh, that flow could be impacting the market. So that's a real-time tool, again, that's watching everything. And you can 
learn some fascinating things about it. So when are people closing put options, right? When are they monetizing downside hedges, for example? Uh, for the last several days, we've seen that anytime that the S&P trades over 4150, traders come out and they start selling calls uh, in the S&P and buying put options. And this is particularly in the spiders. And, and with that, the market tends to recede back to this 4,100 level. And so it's added in a view into how traders are actually, you know, either monetizing or taking risk um, as the day unfolds. And, and again, it's not only from an S&P perspective, but, you know, a lot of people want to identify these gamma squeezes, right? And, and, uh, and or, you know, after uh, earnings, how are traders actually invoking trades, you know, to respond to earnings, right? You can, you can now see uh, you can see inside now the mechanics of, of all that flow. And it's, it's been really fascinating. What's been the biggest surprise that you've learned? Like if we, if I had asked you, you know, you're, you're, you're making this product, you're all excited about it. You have expectations of this and then it ended up being something completely different. What would that be? The, the biggest surprise for me over the past quarter has been the, the trading activity around stocks that have had, you know, kind of catastrophic drops. And, and I mean, but I mean by that is Facebook, Netflix, PayPal, you know, they've had these 25, 30% declines. And the big options activity that's come in has been call selling. And I think that is a lot sourced largely from the volatility trading complex. Guys who are seeking to trade, you know, from an implied volatility perspective, not necessarily from a delta or directional perspective. You know, generally you would think that if these stocks drop uh, 25%, you see big, heavy put, selling, right? I want to, I want, Hey, my, my puts just went up, you know, whatever, four or 5,000% in value. Let me close them or let me try to buy the dip here and buy some calls. But what we see is uh, this volatility trading complex really spike up. And that's not something that we saw at all last year. And I think it ties back into this idea of, of just volatility and Vega and, and you know, being a much more important uh, component of the way that markets are trading now, um, you know, more so than, than the focus historically on, you know, gamma positions, so to speak. And do you think this hero works best uh, or, or not works best? Do you, do you, do you think it has more of a, an edge or, you know, help with your trading more as an individual trader or, or not individual, individual stocks or more the indices? There, there's a huge correlation uh, between what is happening in the S&P and how things are trading in the spiders in particular. And that's been kind of another thing that's been very interesting is I think a lot of people focus on the SPX options because they are notionally quite a bit bigger. But the day-to-day flow in the spiders uh, is oftentimes larger or more impactful um, than the SPX, which is interesting. Uh, and, and you can also see high correlation in the Qs as well to, to how the NASDAQ is trading. So, you know, there's certain names that have very big, consistent uh, options trading. You know, Tesla, Apple, Amazon, you, you kind of know all those names. And, and, and then there's other, you know, stocks that just have a moment, right, where, where there's a flash in the pan of options activity. And, and we try to highlight people that. Uh, but, but I think what it really shows you is um, how important the options complex is, again, to these names where there is just a lot of options volume. And, and you can really see the, the relationship play out in real time. It's, it's quite fascinating. All right, Brett, we've been talking a lot about index, uh, VIX, and all that kind of stuff. But some people enjoy talking about individual names a little bit more. And for those who that just want to, are worried that you are nothing but an index trader, you're actually a lot more than that. And you highlight individual stocks on a regular basis. And you had an interesting one today that you talked about, PBR. Yeah, and th- and this is a small cap name, but I, I think it I think it highlights some of the power of the options impact and influence on the market. And if you look at our data today, is a very large expiration, which is a little bit unusual. Friday the third uh, for for a name like this, where about half of the gamma in the stock is set to expire today, and about half of the deltas as well. And most of that position is tied to the fourteen strike in PBR. And so if you look at how the stock has traded over the last two three days, it's basically pin that level. We're actually at 1402 right now in PBR. And what's interesting is the stock has been somewhat hit pretty hard over the last several weeks. So it was trading around 16 a couple of weeks ago. It's now down to 14. And when you see these options pins removed, basically, you often see a very powerful mean reversion, right? And so we're looking at the stock. And we did a video on our YouTube channel about it today. Uh, we're looking for the stock to rally because there are also some pretty big chunky call positions for the 617 expiration uh, at the 16 strike and again at the 20, which is obviously quite a bit higher than where we're trading now. Uh, but with two weeks to play, it could be kind of an interesting setup. And, and we saw an interesting uh, an interesting setup just like this in GameStop last week where GameStop had, you know, 30 something percent rally. Right. And, and 130 was a very similar pin level for that stock. 
um, and, and the stock mean reverted very hard on, on Monday. It's this idea that you were mentioning before, uh, back when you were a, an index trader, that you get these positioning adjustments, right, around big options expirations, uh, and you get the mean reversion on Monday as all these hedges unwind. And, and so for those of you kind of watching, it, it's an interesting, you know, small cap individual name where you can see this options inflow, uh, options flow play out in, in real time. Great stuff. Why don't you tell people where they can learn more about Spot Gamma and get this sort of information on a regular basis? Yeah, thank you. Uh, so spotgamma.com is our site. You can get a free seven-day trial of our service, uh, which most people like the fact that we put out a daily note, uh, which analyzes the uh, options complex and its impact um, on the markets. Uh, that focuses on the S&P and the NASDAQ as well. Um, and if you have any questions, you can reach me at spotgamma on Twitter or at info at spotgamma.com. Brent, it's always a pleasure to have you on our show. Um, Thank you. I, I, it's, uh, it's always insightful and uh, always stuff to learn. Now, one of the things that we were talking about before the show was that you are living in Easton, Easton, Connecticut. Yeah. And it has a, a rather dubious claim of, uh, to fame. <laughs> there, there's two one i guess ann hathaway lives here so that's maybe oh i didn't realize idea. that that's yeah, the that reason enough life. um she, she's got a big fancy house up here i guess uh but yeah it's the christmas tree capital of just connecticut not not even of the northeast but just connecticut <laughs> is how they stamp the, the claim to fame here but uh it's a nice rural town you know it's it's quiet here and, and i really like it for that reason I, well you know it's funny City for a while and, and that's kind of crazy one of the things that uh, is actually interesting, I didn't realize that you guys were competing with us because I do know that uh, Canadians often put the cut their trees and go down to New York to sell their Christmas trees. It is a big thing. Like, I think they come from Quebec. Yeah, they do. It's always uh, it's always French people who sleep in, in very sketchy looking vans on the sidewalk <laughs> and sell the Christmas trees. And I feel a little sorry for them, but they, they seem to be in good spirits. <laughs> I have a question for you, though. What happened to the to the beer segment? Is that uh, is that still a thing? Uh, the beer segment, yes, it is still a thing. Unfortunately, I got a concussion, so I am I haven't dr- been drinking for the past three months. So oh, it, it's it's kind of made things a little bit tougher for our beer segments. But but Patrick seems to make up for it and drink uh, extra for me. I was gonna say you seemed extra sharp today, actually. <laughs> Listen, Brent, it's always a pleasure to have you on, and we look forward to having you on next expiry. Thanks so you so can tell much. us, uh, you know, if it's just just chunky. Take yeah, care. It's chunky. Thanks one. again. <laughs> All right. Thank Take you. Care. Okay, Patrick, it's time for talking charts. That's right. It's time uh, to talk some charts. Let's uh, quickly touch on those things that we were looking at last week. And uh, the first thing I want to touch on, uh, we were discussing energy. And uh, just simp- it wasn't just ener- uh, oil itself, but like we were looking at nat gas and gasoline and everything that's been just the bull market within the space uh, or within um, all assets. And, and just a quick look here at crude oil. This uh, uh, the July now a lot of people use the continuous contract and observe uh, here. I'll just quickly show that previous high uh, from the March contracts that printed around one thirty on the upside, and we haven't quite reached that. But when you uh, look at how traders trade, which is everyone's now trading this front month uh, July contract, um, that anyone who owns that July contract is already at at, uh, fresh new highs. Uh, And so oil is clearly broken out. It's running. And another interesting observation is the USO, which uh, 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 also owns a strip of uh, of oil contracts rather than rolling the front month like the, when it was uh, that big gong show back in 2020. But uh, the USO also broke to a 52-week high. Uh, and so oil is running, and when uh, and when we uh, just have a quick peek at that uh, gasoline futures, fresh new breakout, even uh, just uh, just running summer driving season, the squeeze at the tank is is happening full full on, and uh, and that gas, even though it's pulled back just a little bit, still have an overall very bullish chart. So uh, the question we asked: Does energy continue? And uh, boy, it has, and it doesn't really feel like uh, this is being. Uh, disrupted in any way right now i i agree with you um although i will say patrick i'm getting little tiny little bits of nervousness for the first time in energy but we will talk about that another day <laughs> okay <laughs> all right <laughs> uh, we were also going to look at what these uh, employment numbers were going to come in at um uh, what did you take away from it well, it was it was almost on the screws, right? And yet, uh, the market seemed to to sell off. It didn't like it. There's there's lots of 
cross currents. There's lots of different things. I would say that although we, the employment numbers were what everyone was watching, we really should have put all the Fed speak. Because no. I think that if there was something that we watched this week, it was Brainerd. She came out, the, obviously, the number two at the Fed. And she's just reiterating the, reiterating the message that the Fed is going to keep raising. And right. I think that we can put aside the idea that they're going to raise more, any more than 50 at a crack. But the market had, uh, had thought that, that maybe we might be able to get a pause. And I think the Fed's showing that they're probably going to go uh, to where they want to go, two and a half, three without a pause, and uh, it's not going to really matter unless things really get ugly. Anyways, interesting developments. Yeah, for sure. Uh, number one thing to watch was uh, whether or not we were going to get a, a market bounce, and we did, and we did. but you know what? I want to talk about equities in, in the top three things this week, so let's leave it at uh, that for last week. So let's move on to the top three things to watch this week uh, or, or this upcoming week. And, um, and the first thing on my mind is uh, we have the ECB next week, and overall, the la you can define the last several weeks of a relief uh, rally uh, in the euro. Uh, there was a, a bounce in the euro stock. Uh, the eurozone seems to kind of had a little bit of uh, a breather from a very bearish sequence. And, uh, and up to bat is um, the ECB. And it'll be really interesting uh, what comes from there. Yeah, yeah. One of the things that's kind of uh, I find fascinating is the fact that we've had a situation where negative rates – Although the front end and the extreme front end of the Europe, European markets are still negative, the market is uh, assumed that we're going to get out from that uh, negative rate and has uh, priced it out. And will this mean anything different for their economy? Will we see? I've always contended, Patrick, that the negative rates are a huge hindrance. And every although the the academics will tell me that it's stimulative to the economy, I I would argue the opposite. I think it's actually negative, and that it's like crossing the streams and Ghostbusters. The bad things happen, and it'll. It, it, I I would love to see them get there sooner rather than later. And nothing would make me happier than to see the Fed. At, I mean, sorry, the ECB at zero or even positive and uh, test my theory out whether this will actually be positive for the for their economy right. i will say this patrick that it sure is hated i don't know anyone that's ever talking about anything good in europe yeah and what's interesting is uh well the euro has just been an awful place uh to be have your money parked and um like we were saying like we went off about a one oh let's round it to a 104 bottom and uh we've seen a three four hundred pip rally off of the lows and um It'll be interesting whether or not the euro can make it back towards 109, 110 on the upside. But I mean, the big this is such a huge weighting in that dollar index. And what the euro does next is going to be the story for the Dixie. And, um, and uh, to me, this still we were overdue for a bounce. And we're getting one. And it's just like the stock markets. It's uh, it's hard to trust this rally at this moment. I'm, I mean, while I'm not a, I certainly would not be out of line for the euro to make it all the way, let's say to 109, 110. I'm not already trying to say it's just a short from here. But uh, you know what? It, it's hard for me to, to want to be on the bull side of that euro chart at this moment. Yeah, I, 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 I'm kind of the same way. But the only thing that just makes me excited about it is the fact that everyone feels that way. There are yeah. no Euro bulls out there. There is nobody arguing that this is uh, good for Europe and that we're headed higher. So well, I, I almost I wonder if it's one of those things, Patrick, climbs a wall of worry. It wouldn't the, like, is yeah, but I think I, you need at least – no, no, but the, the trend has to already be established for the wall of worry to think. Like uh, at this moment, those charts are so distinctly bearish. Uh, that, uh, I mean, I'm willing to climb a wall of worry and, and fade other people's pessimism so long as they're, you know, it's showing like the chart has turned and, and things are working. Uh, and I, inevitably, you're going to see that on, on your thesis. But uh, right now, the charts still look like shit. Though. Well, and the one thing I will say, this is why I'm such a bad trend trader, Patrick, is that uh, a foreign exchange or currencies trend much better than anything else. And you're, you're, you're probably right. The realistically... Uh, I'm sitting around saying that there's no no bulls and that, that we might head higher. That's not a reason enough. This thing could just go down on fundamentals for another couple of years. And uh, all the while, it'll be extremely bearish with no bulls. And it'll just keep chipping away and going that way. And that's probably why I'm not a very good uh, currency trader. Yeah, there you go. Uh, so number two was uh, the inflation numbers. Next week, uh, at the end of the week, we have uh, the CPI coming out. I so what do you think, Patrick? Do you think we finally get some surprise on the downside? Do you think we finally get some inflation numbers that come in 
uh, light. If 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 they do come in light, uh, I am a seller on the idea of sustainable. Like I mean, to me, the single biggest input into that inflation, uh, in my opinion, is energy. And with uh, with us making fresh highs on the in the energy markets, there's going to be continued stress on rising prices. And even if uh, from the consolidation of oil over the last couple of months, if we see inflation temporarily stall, I mean, until we see commodities having uh, run out of bull of steam on the upside, I find it really hard to be already trying to bet on the fade. Um, yeah, but don't forget, Patrick, that the a rate CPI, of change, right? it, the, well, no, CPI is, a, is a, yes, a rate of change. So even if commodities just go sideways, we could go to zero, right, on that, uh, on commodities. Yes. On the com- and uh, of course, uh, the, we're, and this is the a lot of the thesis behind uh, the idea that inflation will slowly uh, revert because you know when uh, you have a doubling of energy prices from fifty bar- a dollar barrel to a hundred, yeah, in order to get the same percentage change, you need oil for, to go from a hundred to two hundred on a year over year basis uh, in order to maintain the same impacts, and so uh, there will be a slowing of inflation, and we will probably see peak inflation at some point, but I. I find it hard to be betting on it right now. Like, well, and it's like when I see the the way that the energy markets are moving, I don't know, bud. Yeah, I hear you. I, I just think it's funny that the, the, the biggest inflation bulls out there were the ones that were the most disinflationists and uh, deflationists at the bottom. And I, di- I, I just, the reality is that markets don't go up forever. They don't go down forever. And yeah. you, you have to be ready for the turn. Yeah. And, and and I and not only that, it's it's I'm not even saying that inflation's gonna come in light in terms of actual like numbers. I just think light in terms of expectations. Right. And that's that's the point that I I, I wonder. Well we'll we're, I, we're I don't find know. We'll out. see. We'll yeah, find we'll, out we'll next find week. It. Yeah, exactly. And so and number one I just uh, going back to that's why we didn't want to touch too much on the equity side, but like um, obviously we got a market bounce, and the uh, and the question on my mind going into next week was this just a very oversold short squeeze bounce, uh, and are we still in a primary bear market that it'll just uh, inevitably have this uh, roll right over, or is this some sort of a more meaningful short to intermediate low? And uh, the markets are, let's say, headed for retesting their previous highs. It's like, so when you look at these charts, uh, I'd like to highlight the, the two rallies we had, one in January and this rally back over here, which was that nice short squeeze that we had in March. And each one of them uh, were uh, just a typical kind of bear uh, market um, squeeze. This was a, an, a an not close to 9% 400 point move. And uh, this one over here was a... Uh, one uh, a twelve percent five hundred point move, and so here uh, in a similar time frame, we have bounced and and reached a a ten percent rally in about four hundred points. So we've now bounced uh, in a very similar uh, manner to the last two bounces. And while we could certainly go up another hundred points and go to forty three hundred, but if this was just a short term little short squeeze. Uh, it should start to stall out here in the next little bit. And, uh, and one of the things I'm going to be watching is whether the market gets heavy and whether the big money uses this rally to sell into and whether the whole thing starts to roll over into next week or the week after. And uh, that's, uh, I think, the number one thing to watch. What do you think? Well, I, I think that's some great analysis. And to your point, we really haven't gone anywhere this week at all. Yeah. Right? Well, it, it's been a lot and of it, sideways action. And up, down, whenever up, down, we've in. seen a major bottom, the buyers just keep rolling in. Like when, when once that uh, feedback loop starts and, and the buyers are uh, s- smell that bottom, think off of that March 2020 low, right? Like once uh, once the low was in, the, uh, there was no stopping the buyers. It was just up every single day. And it really just doesn't feel like there's any enthusiasm to buy the dip here. Well, and I especially agree on the tech part. Patrick, I, I continue to hate the tech. I, I think it's headed a lot lower and that there's still lots and lots yeah. of pain to be had there. The real question for me is can the other stocks rally amongst a bear market and a continued bear market in tech, which I definitely think is going to continue and, and is going to get a lot worse. And I don't know the answer to that. And yeah. and, and not only that, how that me what that means for the index is is much different. And that's one of the things that I uh, 
I'm uh, kind of hesitant to go trade the indexes and make calls on them because I think that there's going to be huge divergences within different groups. And it w- it could still, I, I, I'm going to stick to my call that this mar- this year, the indexes frustrate everyone. Do, right. do almost nothing. Right. Well, uh, we'll uh, we'll see. So let's uh, let's talk some charts. So the first thing I wanted to highlight, just look how actually pathetic the rally's been in the Nasdaq. You were just talking those techs, but in you, typically uh, a, a very normal secondary reaction uh, is a, a market snapping back fifty percent of its prior move. And so, uh, as an example, uh, back over here when the market. Um, drop 20% or 3,700 points on the NASDAQ, uh, it, it uh, gained more than half of that back in the snapback rally uh, on, that, that occurred on that little squeeze. But you, you put into context here, this the NASDAQ since March wiped out 3,700 points, 25% in just a month, right? Like it was just a bloodbath, just over a month, uh, a, a huge bloodbath to the downside. And uh, in the last five days, the bounce saw like a pathetic little uh, uh, little reaction, not uh, not even able to uh, to make it uh, above what were its previous lows. Uh, it's uh, it was just a very weak attempt to rally these tech names, and um, that just doesn't bode well. Uh, I think that that's a that's a negative, and it's it's hard for me to uh, to want to jump onto the bull camp when uh, this is the best that they can do. Yeah, and, and so I'm uh, I'm a little skeptical. Like I I I technically I always like to let the price action do the talking, and this price action shit. It's uh, it's <laughs> there shit. you go. It's uh, <laughs> that's the that's the technical term for it. Shit. Yeah. It's shit. <laughs> the, 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 uh, so is that on the technical an- analysis uh, and, you know uh, exam? What uh, did they, they they put a chart and they say what do you think of this chart? This price, no, your, no. What do you think of this price action? And it's you're just shit. like it's shit. Okay. <laughs> Passing great. <laughs> All right. So uh, just um, uh, what, <laughs> let's move on to the dollar. And obviously, we talked about the euro a little bit. Um, and obviously, after a huge bull run on the upside over or three, four months on the dollar index to the upside, uh, a pullback is a typical thing. Uh, but uh, the, the bigger question, is there some sort of evidence that the prevailing bull market in the dollar has run its course and that this was some sort of a major top. And uh, my answer to that is I don't see any evidence of that. Uh, my uh, first inclination is to approach this uh, dollar as a buy on dip and uh, and see whether or not it goes. And one of the things that was interesting about that is look at the way the US dollar yen is ripping again. Yeah, so don't remind me. Yeah. You know what's funny it's, that we uh, I'll, I'll just he's probably listening, but we've had a very smart uh, fellow on the show that I talked to that likes to be below the radar, and he literally phoned me up at the bottom of that thing, right like right there, and I said, twenty-seven, what, and said, you know, I think you should cover your again, and I was like, I did cover a little because it was him, and he seems to know a lot, but I should have covered every single piece. Yeah, uh, it, it just it, it just ripped. well, it's come it's coming to such a critical level. Like if this breaks to a fifty two week high, uh, I mean it's really got nothing in its way from running to one thirty five. Um, it's uh, it, now has it broken to a new high? No, can it reject along its previous overhead resistance and and stall? Sure. But this is such a critical one to watch. I think it's a, it's at a very important moment, and I think it will be a very clear advertisement that uh, the dollar bull is still um, it, very much in play if it does manage to make that new high. And uh, I think it's 100% something to watch going into next week, right? Yeah. It, you know when it'll bottom? When, when I sell it. Yeah, when I, when yeah, I sell just, it all. Please tell me. Yeah, I was talking to the boys about this, by the way, and they were asking, they were talking about different signs of uh, capitulation or different things that they believe in. And they were telling me how that you can, how you can stop a market by, by giving up, uh, you know, taking a portion of your position off. And I said, I don't know what God you guys are uh, worshiping, but my God requires it all to be taken (laughs) off. Yeah, you, they don't accept the, tr- the trickery of uh, yeah, here, yeah. I'll, I'll sell a little I don't know. Bit. I just think maybe they're younger, they're nicer, the <laughs> gods are better to them. But like uh, for me, the market gods refuse to to change the trend until I take it all off. They know. 
The market gods they know. know. They're like, they know. you know, screw you. That was a 10% you took off. That doesn't Maybe count. it's just the fact that you trade in such a big size that you are the market. So. No, <laughs> no, no. It said they, the market gods know. It's probably that I trade in such big size that I'm overextended and I've got yeah. too much. And that's what they know. They're, 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 you're like the little the whale. Everyone's just waiting for you to make your move. Yeah. And then well, anyways, like, the nah. market gods, uh, I, I don't know. I just, I Let's, wasn't. I wasn't good enough. Uh, I I did too many horrible things as a kid, or something. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Let's uh, let's touch on the asset that shall not be named. Oh. And um and what what I found really interesting about um, that Bitcoin chart. Oh, I said it. Shit. Uh, was That's that fine. um it had a green breakout candle, and so we had a trade range. And uh, to me, breakout candles are really important because from a there are a, a wave of technical analysts out there that are waiting for. Uh, a signal point, some point to say that the market is active again and it's time to pay attention, time to put some money to work there. So whenever a breakout candle occurs, I look at it as an opportunity to see uh, whether or not it's ready to go. And what I found amazing was that it was a very clear breakout candle that should have traditionally spurred some uh, further buying. And within days, gave it all back. They filled yeah. it like a butter tart. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they saw a bid and they filled it like a butter tart. Yeah. Uh, that's a very Canadian uh, expression there. Uh, Patrick, yeah. I completely agree with you. Why? Uh, you know me, I don't practice the dark art, but one of the fa my favorite things about uh, technical analysis that I think really truly works is failed uh, patterns. Meaning, yeah. because that just sucked in a whole bunch of people that are now offside and is in, it's telling you it's headed lower. But it also tells you whether or not the market's ready to bull something. Because if the, if uh, if uh, you get a bull signal and, and bulls suddenly come in in a storm and start buying and, and creates that feedback mechanism that runs the market, uh, then uh, then you've got a new bull trend. You've got to jump onto the coattails and go for a ride. Uh, and so watching the reaction, whether it's a failed one or whether it sticks, is actually always critical. And it's something I, I, I really do like to watch. Just wanted to touch on gold and silver. I just wanted to highlight highlight that while I remain um, quite a, a gold and silver bull in the bigger picture, uh, you know what? I have to call it the way it is. The chart looks like shit on both of them. Uh, That's another and, technical analysis, yeah. uh, sophisticated analysis from Patrick there. That is, it is the the, the crayon is thick and the uh, and and the chart is shit. And so, but uh, the the point. <laughs> <laughs> the point is, is, is that it's uh, I like you know what I I think that there's a great buying opportunity coming when these things start to actually look uh, half like they're being accumulated and they're turning. But uh, this is a uh, still a, like a very frustrating chart that uh, has a very reasonable chance of going to retest its lows. I don't know whether it'll make new lows, but uh, I think uh, for the month of June, uh, gold and silver traders should at least in the back of their mind uh, uh, be um, ready to go through a bit of a rinse cycle, as it's going to probably be very volatile and dire directionless. I uh, think Patrick, you you nailed that analysis, except for one slight point. Which is why you said something about there will be a, a buying opportunity and then you listed all this technical mumbo jumbo and you really should have just said when Patrick and I sell or when <laughs> Kevin and I sell. <laughs> I'm hedged. I'm happy to be. Oh, there you go. You're always hedged. Those long vol traders. They're always. Yeah, I'm good either way. OK. Well, not no. good every way, but I'm not going to get hammered. No. Uh, the um, uh, just touching on that uh, that uranium play, and what uh, what is uh, certainly in the last couple of days on Sprott Physical Uranium, it's it's worked its way a little bit higher. But to be honest, uh, considering the magnitude of the prior selling, I uh, would have uh, thought there would have been a stronger reaction. Uh, now it might come, and and we might have you know Monday a big update, a rips to seventeen, and uh, and it's uh, then everything is fine. But right now it's uh, it's it's just incredibly quiet. It's like everyone is just uh, saying, nah, I think we're going to take a break from uranium for a while, and it's just uh, just sitting there churning. Okay, well, I'm going to take the other side of this trade. I'm going to say oh. that it's extremely constructive action. It's grinding higher. No one's talking about it. It's, it's a quiet, quiet little bull market. There's exactly what I like. I, I'm I'm going to be a buyer. We just went through two weeks of the markets taking nice, uh, big squeezes to the upside and things ripping, and uranium's been crawling. And you're telling me that's a good thing? God, I, I, listen. Okay, well, no. that's that's what makes no. a market. We'll take the, yeah. I'll take the other side. I well, think I mean, I know you're just talking your book. You're loaded no. up to the gills on this. No, shit. I, I, so I definitely, so I definitely like this, but up. like, but listen, <laughs> I, I, you. Know, 
know, at times own lots of gold and silver. And I, w- and I'm, I wasn't talking about that being a good looking charter or, or behaving well. I completely agree with you. That one's trading. Those are trading like shit. I don't think this looks as that bad. I think it's grinding higher. And I think it's just kind of quietly being accumulated. I think well, the surprises will your, be your, on the your, opi- your opinion will change when Monday there's a big red candle that uh, goes no. slamming to 15. And then no, because have- you know that. Because that'll be just like, I'll just pull out the old blue tickets and just buy more. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> All right. I wanted to just touch on this downtrend in lumber. I know uh, I know a few uh, friends and fellow colleagues that are loaded uh, up on the home builders thinking that uh, there's a huge buying opportunity. I don't know if you know any of these people. No, I don't uh, know any. It's like that. Uh, I know no one. But uh, – you know what I, I I always have observed the kind of the correlation of home builders to lumber prices and uh, uh, and they seem to be have some correlation and the lumber just keeps eating it and uh, and I just wonder like when I look at the uh, this home builder chart it kind of reversed up but it's like is this I don't know if I want to get excited about these home builders yet it's don't. Uh, I know don't thank you don't right. get excited about them you keep shitting all over them. Well, listen, when Lumber joins the party, I might uh, start drinking some of your Kool-Aid. But uh, right now, I think that uh, I'm, I'm just patient with these. I, you know, maybe yeah, by the listen, end of the summer. You know what? You might be right there. I have no idea about timing. They're, they very well could go sideways. To, to I mean, listen, well, I, 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 hear, I hear this the story from you and Copy. Like, they are cheap. They are cheap. There's no uh, – I'm not going to in any way argue against that. I'm not going to take the other side of that story. But I just think you got, uh, it's one of these that's cheap and you're going to be waiting. Yeah. Uh, well, the other thing is you have to remember, do that on a relative basis to, like, spoos. It's actually not trading that bad. Like, it, it well, looked – it had a big it had a big move but like in the last two months it's it's outperformed it's been a it's it's just put relative, it against the spy yeah but in the last two months it's been a, it's you know it in the last him, two months what do you want just two months uh yeah like or not uh, two months last orange month. is the spooze what, what uh, do you want you, well, can't you excited, give me the relative excited. can't you give me relative no no i'm just looking at the percentage overlay all i'm saying is that that's not exciting news dude I like that's so. uh, like I'm not saying that you. you I'm not saying I'm, I'm wrong. You're just saying there's better uh, places to be. Look, that's fine. I, I know. I'm. I'm. I'm, just, I'm not even. I'm not going to short the home builders. I have zero interest in taking the other side of your trade or something. I'm just. Uh, uh, I'm just not uh, in in the camp that I think that uh, it's going to all start working from here. Yeah. The question uh, is like, what has what is working? There's not much. Energy. That's it. Like I mean, like literally. Yeah. I mean, the copper had a bit of a turn, but that's another one. Let me just quickly touch on this one. And uh, but uh, like when you take a quick peek at copper, had the big breakout candle, uh, and very similar to what we are looking at from a, a price action perspective, and things like what we were talking about with Bitcoin. One of the things I'm going to be really interested to see with such an extraordinarily strong uh, uptick in uh, in copper. It'll be really interesting to see whether or not um, uh, it gives it back, uh, or whether they get, they the bulls can hold the gains. Uh, I mean, I then the most disappointing thing I think would be for copper would be back to four and a quarter by the end of next week. And if we saw that, then that would be a complete fake out to the upside. Uh, the bulls really need to dig in and hold the line up here. And some of those copper stocks, let's use like Freeport McMoran had a nice uptick. Southern, I'll just use the copex, just use the basket. Um, but uh, you know, the copper stocks had a good reaction. But uh, I mean, is it a new bull run? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'd love to see. Like, first of all, I'm, I'm big picture bullish copper. Uh, but I would love to see uh, the bulls dig in and hold a consolidation and just really show that they've started to accumulate this. But right now, uh, the jury's still out. I think uh, I'm going to wait another week or two to make so, a higher conviction call on it. So, copper bulls, you hear that? Patrick wants you to do a William Wallace. Hold. Yeah, hold the line. Yeah, pull out, hey, pull out the big pitchfork or whatever go. those uh, thing, and like hold the line there. Yeah. It's uh, thing. Anyway, I think that's enough. I uh, yeah, that's uh, that's what I want. Was there another one I should have covered? We should maybe look at the Tesla chart, maybe. Oh uh, no, are you gonna Gucci? I'm not Tesla gonna. Okay, no, no. Did not let you just say. And something. it's very. It's it's like I I love. I don't know who I took this from, but it's a, Tesla is the got the Marmite reaction, which I think is the ter- most terrific and awesome. Uh, description of something ever you know found. Be- basically, people either hate Tesla or love it, and right. there's no, you know. Now you'll get some of the Tesla 
lovers will go, I don't like the stock or whatever. But that's only because it's being hammered so bad. If the stock was a thousand, they would love it. Um, but uh, I, I, Patrick, are you going to say something? You say your technical mumbo jumbo. Go for it. Sure. I mean, look. Uh, the bounce is pathetic, just as pathetic as the Nasdaq bounce. It hasn't been able to uh, um, uh, to make it back into the trade range of its previous lows, um, and that's a, a sign of a distinct downtrend. And there's no sign of a bottom, so you have to respect the prevailing downtrend. No comment. Okay, <laughs> that's it for talking charts. That's all I got. All right, let's go on. No, I don't want to gooch it. Skin in the game. We're still doing this. Yeah. Okay, who well, won the last I mean, but, but, one? Do you even remember? Yeah, well, yeah, because we bet on the yen. It was, oh, it's and been I a, lost? It's been a, yeah, it's been a while, but uh, you lost. Yeah, that uh, you, that you, makes you, sense. Because you, you bet on your own book. Um, I know, which you should never, ever do. And not only that, I'm telling you, I, as I mentioned, someone much smarter than me uh, told me to take it off, and I, and I didn't listen. It teaches yeah. me. You know, like yeah. when, you know, when you get that, when they reach out to you to tell you you're an idiot, you know. <laughs> I hope he's listening. You'll get a kick out of that. Okay. Skin in the All Game right. is our weekly opportunity for us to demonstrate that we are degenerate gamblers at heart. Every week, one of us presents a wager, and the other guy chooses which side of the bet he wants. Every wager needs to settle by next episode, and the currency for the wagers is as follows. A duke, a duke, a pint of beer, a burger, bet, a pitcher, a case of beer, a bottle of wine, and a steak dinner. The winner of the bet is obligated to create a new bet for the following week. All wagers settle in full, and there will be no netting of positions, as we demonstrated this week. By the way, Patrick... I am going to talk to you offline uh, next week about potentially changing this game a little. Okay. But we can't do it now. I I didn't didn't make time. Uh, We're not going to do it on the air. But by the way, I do have a little story. You know what? I'll save it for the after after party. Okay, sure. Okay, let's go. All right. So I I won the bet. So why why don't you tell the rules of bet? I did. Or the game. Oh, did you? Okay. So, uh, <laughs> I, you know, that's how much I was listening. Okay. So, uh, have let's another say, one of your sour beers. Yeah, there, exactly. Man. The, um, uh, so I'm, it's my turn because I won the, uh, yeah, the you bet. won. Yeah. So I'm going to make a bet. And I, you know what? Why don't we just go where uh, it's a little raw and we'll go to the home builders? Oh, nice. And, I like uh, it. I no, like but it. Let, let's just keep this super, super clean. At the time right now, it's 650. 650. <laughs> Higher or lower? Up. You're going up. All yeah. right. I'll take the down. What do you uh, what do you want? Uh... Uh, I'll do a steak. <sighs> okay, do a bottle of wine. Okay. All right. Okay, bottle of wine it is. It's uh, I I okay, b- bottle of wine. Bottle of wine. Yeah. It's done. Okay, from the clothes can I, can on I, can, to can, can I tonight's can I, can I do can I do the um can I no off of tonight's clothes? Okay, sure. Yeah, but, so give uh, me can, a chance to sell my position. Can I now settle to get a with uh, Portuguese tick. wine since it's like? Yes, you uh, can. Uh, yes, you can. You can settle it's, with it. Uh, <laughs> so much cheaper. <laughs> so much cheaper. <laughs> All right. Okay. So uh, I, I let, heard actually my one of my friend's daughters went there and she was saying that the, the thing they liked the best was buying ninety eight ninety five euro cents like cents like less than a euro boxed wine like like juice boxes is this true i didn't see them but i'm i'm sure they might exist you, 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 you're gonna be checking them out next but, time uh, see but, it already. but getting um getting a, a portuguese bottle of wine that's in the like uh, three to ten euro uh that is actually a half decent wine is uh shocking like that's unheard of like when i used to talk about those prices you think you're gonna get like some apple cider vinegar or something uh, I, and by the way, one of our uh, at the piss up, one of our uh, listeners that was came to it reminded me that Cuppy talked about the Portuguese wine being the best wine ever in a box. Remember, yeah. he said that. that yeah, the, you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna end up in the uh, uh, Azores uh, this summer as well, so I'm gonna have to try uh, see if I can wine. find the same same boxed wine that he was drinking. To I'll test this theory. Okay. <laughs> okay, so what are you gonna? So we got that done. Now let's yeah. go to no stupid questions. Lena, hop on and help it's, us out. It's been a while with yeah. the questions. It has. Yeah. So are you guys ready to answer? Yes, let's do it. <laughs> okay. Hi. Hi. Given how high inflation is, how fast rates have moved, and how much stocks have fallen, would it be reasonable to think that we're already seeing a substantial tightening in financial conditions? Surely, inflation and supply must hurt both consumer and co- company margins. Mortgage rates have spiked, and the wealth effect has taken a hit. Is it correct to assume that the Fed is not looking for a specific target in rates, whatever that is, rather a sufficient decline in employment and or wage increases? Love the show. That's a great question. 
That is a terrific question. You answer and, it then. Okay. <laughs> the, 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 the Federal Reserve has said numerous times that the transmission mechanism from their policy to the real economy is through financial conditions. So they are specifically, as this listener has, has noted, they, the Federal Reserve is specifically tight, uh, targeting to tighten financial conditions. Now, there's a wide variety of different uh, how you measure financial conditions. There's uh, the stock market. There's the VIX. There's the credit spreads. There's the U.S. dollar. There's a, a variety of different other ones. And there's a whole bunch of, you know, the, Fed, uh, the Federal Reserve of Atlanta has one. I think the Chicago has one. Uh, Bank of America has got one. Uh, J- uh, Goldman Sachs has got one. Everyone's got one in a different way uh, that they use and they measure it. The Fed probably looks at a common of all sorts of different factors and one of the things that i think is interesting is that for a while um financial conditions were tightening and it was going exactly how the fed wanted we saw credit widening we saw stocks going down we saw the u.s dollar going down but patrick can you very quickly just pull up a chart of hygh which is the high yield hedged which in yep. essence is the credit spreads yeah you'll see that uh, what was that? Can you tell me what date that bottomed on? Because it yeah, bottomed... that, that that bottomed on uh, the May nineteenth. Yeah. So yeah. for the, like a, a couple of weeks ago, we had a situation where financial conditions were tightening, and the trouble is that the last couple of weeks they've uh, gone the other way. They've gone exactly opposite of what the Feds wanted, and I think that is partly why you saw Brainerd this week getting on to CNBC or Bloomberg or wherever she was talking about how the Fed is going to continue to be tough. And so I'm 100% with you that uh, that they use those and that you should be watching those. And that is uh, that is the whole game right there. All right, let's go to the next one. Second one here. The U.S. government is selling oil from the SPR every day. If oil futures out a year or two are around $65, wouldn't it make more sense for them to be buying them to offset their sales, which in turn would force the futures higher and hence would not only encourage more drilling, but lock in huge profits on their current sales and guarantee the replacement of the reserves? Shit, that sounds smart. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> we just found our next president. <laughs> now, I'm not even sure. I think that they're I, – I, I have to look into this a little bit, but I do believe that they are doing this to some extent and that it's just one of these things that is not talked about a lot, but I don't know for sure. But I did see someone that was much more knowledgeable to me explain that there is an element of that going on. But 100% the the, the – uh, the government should be replacing the oil that they're selling with uh, by taking delivery in the future. There you go. All I right. So, uh, not I, only that, know, it would help a cuppy's uh, long dated. Yeah, uh, cuppy will not complain at That's all. Right. <laughs> at all. <laughs> all right, but no, laugh. listen. As, but as an aside, the best trades are the ones that make the most sense, and you don't need uh, some sort of convoluted logic to to get there. It just seems like common sense, and so that often is the best trade. All right. Okay, so last question of the week. Patrick will often talk about accumulation and distribution or stocks being bought or sold. Obviously, there is always a buyer for every seller, so there is never a net buying or selling. What is meant by those terms? Isn't any accumulation necessarily offset by an equal amount of distribution? Another common idea is cash on the sidelines. With matched buyers and sellers, how do you get net changes in cash on the sidelines? Excluding dividends, is it possible for cash on the sidelines to change without exogenous cash entering the capital markets? Yeah, those are all for you, Patrick. Well, I'll let you answer the second half of that one. But the Uh, first part I want to talk about, like, in the end, of course, there's uh, every one share, there's one buyer and one seller on either side of it. So when the volume crosses, there was an equal amount of buyers and sellers. But uh, let's use a real estate analogy. When... Uh, the real estate market is hot and uh, there's a wave of buyers bidding and there's only one house that they're all interested in. And when there's two or three uh, bids coming in, what's uh, the only way that that one transaction will happen is, is when one of them bids higher than everyone else to uh, finalize the transaction. So even though there was an equal amount 
of um, of people, one person bought and one person sold. Uh, it um, price discovery is all about whether or not there's more buyers uh, and therefore taking prices higher, or more sellers that are are therefore pushing prices lower to find that offsetting term. Like that's price discovery. Would you describe it a different way? No, I thought that was terrific, and I wouldn't even know how to do it because that's uh, technical analysis. And I always thought that he was talking about all these different technical terms. I thought there was going to be shit look at charge in there too but that wasn't asked <laughs> the shit price action okay i'm going to take you the second part of it um one Cash of the pro- well, yeah well one of the ideas that i think that this uh, listener is missing is the fact that uh they're assuming that the amount of stock let's just use stocks for example that the supply stays the same and the supply can change for a variety of different re- reasons issuance buyback that's not just dividends uh, there's, so there's that element. Then there's also an element of changes within asset classes. So, you know, Patrick mentioned real estate. What happens if somebody sells a real estate and goes and takes that cash and decides that they'd rather own stocks. So, and then uh, there's, uh, so many different, it's, it's a big, huge monster system. And it is difficult to say when you have, let's just say, a static point and you measure, Oh, there's all this cash on the sidelines and therefore it means X. Uh, you're he, that listener is absolutely correct. That, that those, that cash might be taken away. It might be going and spent on the real economy. It might come out of the real economy and go there. So it is difficult to, to kind of use that as a real indicator on the whole though. What w- you will find is that they will go and uh, strategists and uh, will try to and quants will try to look at out of the money that is allocated to stocks or to a, a specific asset class, how much is currently deployed and how much is sitting there as a balance that is waiting to be deployed. But you, you know, all those things that that listener mentioned about the problems with that analysis is, is 100% correct. All right, Lena. So if you have any questions for Kevin and Patrick, <laughs> please submit your questions to no stupid questions at markethuddle.com. Fantastic. So that's All right. it. So that's thanks for wrap. tuning into the Market Huddle. We appreciate you spending some time with us. Please give us a follow on Twitter there at the Market Huddle. You know why. And uh, if you could go rate and review us on iTunes. Uh, and you will, again, know the reason for that. Patrick, where can they find you? You can follow me at uh, BigPictureTrain.com or on Twitter at Patrick Ceresna. Kev, where can they find you, buddy? I'm on Twitter at Kevin Muir, or you can check out my newsletter at TheMacroTourist.com. And listen, we can never have too many friends. Bear market, bull market. We're just happy to spend some time together on this crazy ride. So thanks for tuning in, and now stick around for the after show. All right. Okay, so let's do the beer, and then we got a lot of things to talk about. Yeah, you know, you know what? I I liked it. I liked it. It was uh, of course maybe, you did. Yeah, I did. You I like did. the you like it's, the fruity sour. At first, <laughs> after, yeah, but no, no, no. I, I no, actually, this is actually a rather uh, dark beer, and actually, um, it, it doesn't drink smooth the way of, uh, those lighter uh, sours do, but. It actually, after drinking it, it's it's one of these beers that is not sessionable. Here I'm using that word again. I make fun of me. Go for it. But uh, no, because you because it's not sessionable. I'll let you I'll, I'll let you uh, get away with it. It's, it's allowed. A, it's one of these where you know you you have this like a, almost like a, a dessert beer after dinner. It actually would be perfect. It's it's nice. Um, I, I think any beer that's not sessionable is another way of saying it's bad. So what's your review? What? <laughs> No, forget that. I'm going to give it a 7.9. Okay, there we go. Uh, Lena, yes. you had something you wanted to say. You said remind Oh, about us. the piss-up. Yes. yes. So, um, you know, it was a great turnout. There was a lot more people than I had anticipated. Oh, you were selling us short, were you? <laughs> I was like, oh, you know, it's on a Wednesday. I'm not sure. A lot of people say they were going to come, but, you know, you never know. It's not yeah. an RSVP event. Um, and I had sent out a Twitter poll in the beginning of the week. And said, I gave people two options, you know, about the piss up. And one of them was, I'll be there. Or the second one was, my wife won't let me. Now, 80% of the people voted, my wife won't let me. Yeah. And that's where I go, you got to get yourself a partner that looks at you the way Kevin looks at Patrick. Oh, my God. 
because it was a great piss up that you missed if you didn't if you couldn't come because of your wife stopping you from going. I know that there's one gentleman that couldn't come because he had to go furniture shopping. I I know. <laughs> well, what's not? He's like the fellow in Because uh, that's what else you do on a Wednesday than go furniture shopping. Yeah, that's what exactly. I, that is like you go to work, finish. Hey, we're going that's furniture like, shopping. That's like Frank the Tank when he's at, yeah. the, at the party and he's like, we're, we miss his heaven. We're going to, we're we going have to a, Home Depot. We have a day planned, a little uh, Bed Bath and Beyond, and if we're lucky, we'll get to uh, Home Depot and blah, blah, blah. That's just like this fellow. Happy wife, happy life. You're absolutely right. But you know, Lena. Yeah. What about if you have a husband? If you have a husband, then I'm sh- I'm, I'm hoping he'd want to go with you. I know, you. but my point is, you said you assumed it was wife. That's wrong. Yeah, well, when you see the I'm picture, gonna call, it's I'm not, gonna call, it's, uh, I mean, yes, uh, but if well, you look at the what picture, about if you're there's two like... guys married to you, whatever. You're not being very politically correct, Lena. Not very proud of you. Oh, okay, that's true. You should have said partner. I am not You should have said partner. Partner. I just thought it'd be funnier if it was wife. I know, it is funnier, <laughs> but you know what, that... But that itself, listen, I guess... The then one, I can't answer happy wife, happy life, right? I guess like, there's that's no, true. And the know. thing is, you as a woman can write that. Patrick and I wouldn't be allowed to. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Anyways, it was a really great, it was a really great time. It was unfortunate that it rained because inside was like, uh, it was loud. It was very loud. It was loud. loud. And, yeah. I, and I, and I, like my voice was gone. And oh, yeah. Every, it went, it went long. It went, uh, we had some, the Die Hard crew, we came down to... We closed the bar almost to with ten with ten of them. Yeah, but uh, but we did close the bar. They were kicking us out. They wanted to close. We were the only ones <laughs> on left. On a Wednesday night. <laughs> on a Wednesday night, they were like they were like guys. We have to we have to close. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and some of these people have tweeted back to us after we posted a picture from the piss up, and they're like, "Where are the ladies?" Like, there's multiple tweets about it. I'm like, "This is a piss up, not a frosh freak." Mixer, yeah. <laughs> so there were some ladies there. There were, there some, were some ladies. Yeah, yeah. They you just couldn't see them in the picture. I knew, yeah. they were yes. they were so good. And uh, and it so was nice. and it was really great. It was, everyone was so kind and nice. And uh, there was um, uh, I'll I'll just kind of mention this briefly. The Paul Craig from uh, from the Peak came to see me, and he he came for the piss uh, piss up, and he had glowing reviews of everyone. He said, you know, they're just a truly terrific bunch, and. Uh, I, I must say that I was so surprised, like not surprised, but so proud of the fact that we have such great listeners. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. hundred, you know, and that's how I, I feel, as I said, I, it's truly heartfelt when I said that it really meant a lot to find out that people were so kind and nice. By the way, I, I mentioned the two boys from Barry, the other two <laughs> boys that, that should be mentioned that I think are hilarious were the two boys that do, um, they are professional bachelor party planners from Montreal. <laughs> did you guys not talk to these yeah, guys? Yeah, I did. Totally. <laughs> totally. Like, like, okay, uh, you know, what are you going to do with your life? Well, I really want to be a professional bachelor party planner. Anyways, terrific guys. Great uh, that is they, amazing. That's a great they idea. They do a lot of Wall Street stuff. They, they literally, they get a lot of people from Wall Street uh, coming up to Montreal. Because, look, listen, Montreal, pretty great town. Play, great place yep. to have a bachelor party. Um, and not only that, the Americans coming up have diplomatic immunity. Because let's just face it, you know, you get in trouble in another country, a lot of times they just want to get rid of you. They don't bother <laughs> charging you. It's <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, fuck, just send him home. Don't charge him. You know, he spent the night in jail. Just send him home. And, Let them uh, deal with it. Uh, so you have diplomatic immunity. You got Montreal, which is terrific. And then you got the, the boys uh, planning. It's, it's awesome. Like, it oh, was, and the dollar. Not the matter. dollar, yeah, forget, yeah, you know. So it's it's, it's it was fascinating, but they were uh, they were very typical. I was actually surprised at how many people um, that with COVID they found themselves with nothing to do for their job, and they and they started going around and they uh, and they stumbled upon us, and they they were kind of true huddlers, and they felt like they should drive from Montreal and come to do it. So. Hugely appreciative oh. that people coming from San Diego, Idaho, Ohio, all over the place. I was just absolutely floored and, and honored and, uh, and and absolutely shocked that people came that far. Not only that, San Diego is such nice weather, surfing. Like, why you go <laughs> <the> back? <laughs> oh uh, you know. So, anyways, it was it was a lot of fun. What was your biggest yeah. surprise, Patrick? Oh no! It just uh, I, I'm I was actually surprised uh, by how many people were out of town. I knew people were going to come from out of town, 
but uh, for that percentage amount of them that came from out of town was uh, was my surprise, and, it, and I'm I'm just like uh, honored when I hear like when I, you know, people that are taking the time to come out of their way to meet us. Uh, I know it's uh, like it's because at this point I know it's free beer, so like well, there's a lot of people come for the free beer, but you're you're definitely out some money, but when you're flying from you know California, yeah, yeah. for a couple of free beers, yeah, you ain't. You ain't. <laughs> So we're just very, you know, that's very nice of them to take yeah. their time. And, and then I was shocked at how many of them are going right back. I was like, you're coming all this way. Money. At least stay a few days. No, you no, know, we're not like, that. Yeah. We're not that bad. We're not. Canadians aren't that bad. There's things to do. You know what? They're probably like, I went to the hockey hall of fame. Not much else to do. I went home. <laughs> <laughs> Weather was shit. I got to go. <laughs> that's- we even did it right beside the hockey hall of fame for everyone. Yeah. For the other yeah, yeah, to make it super easy. Yeah. Yeah. But they didn't. They didn't. <laughs> Do you know what the thing is? They're not as impressed. No. Like, they're just, like, you know, they're just not as impressed as we are about the Hockey Hall of Fame. Yeah, but Hockey Hall of Fame, I think, is, like, something to get excited about when you're 14. You think? Yeah. Oh. But you get to see the cup. Do you know that you're not allowed, if you're a real hockey player, and you, if you, like, if you get an NHL player, and the cup's there, and they have it. it. Yeah. If they they haven't won it. If they haven't won it, they don't touch it. No. So like when we go, that's, that's that's the ultimate hockey gucci. Yeah, <laughs> that's uh, they. they so like if Patrick and I are our hopes of ever touching the winning the cup are zero and always were zero. So we'll be like, oh, you know, hugging oh. it and grabbing, putting our dirty little paws all over it. But a real hockey player will not touch it unless they will they're not. Mean. Will not. Hmm. Is that, that? Yeah, it's fascinating. Okay, let's talk. Makes sense. I was surprised at how many people liked our our uh, show reviews, Lena. So. Uh, because Patrick barely contributes to this part. So, yeah, I can't. Um, <laughs> I have something to tell you. Uh, uh, maybe you've seen it. The Staircase. Uh, is it the documentary or the TV show? So Okay, so for those who don't know, there was The Staircase is a documentary about a murder that was in the 80s. I mean, sorry, 2000, around then. Uh, 2001 or something like that. Interestingly enough, the woman that got killed worked for Nortel even though it was in the States. So it was a little bit of a Canadian uh, edge there. Um, and she hated Nortel, which is a little, much like many Canadians. Um, but no, it's the, they then went out of this. There was a documentary about the murder. And this docu- these documentarians spent like years doing this. And now there's a movie, or sorry, a series, an HBO series, about the whole thing that includes, as the storyline, the documentarians. So I was watching oh. the HBO thing. Okay, it's got oh. Colin Firth, and I don't know the woman's name. I think but, it's Tony Collette. Okay, but there is a scene in there, Lena. Like, I don't okay. consider myself a prude. Okay. <laughs> and I know the world has become much more accepting of stuff. But I, I just want you to watch it, Lena, and get back to me and see if you have a scene that caught you off guard and... It really did very little to the plot. Kind of and like unnecessary. Must, like, why did they put this in here? And must have been some of the most awkward uh, actor to actor <laughs> discussions oh, no. ever. Oh, no. Oh, no. So I'm going to wait for you, Lena, to go watch oh, it. I'm going we'll to have to watch it this week. <laughs> I'm going to have to watch it this week. <laughs> Catches you off guard. It's out of nowhere. Interesting. I have to see it now. Okay. For those who have, th- for those who uh, who have watched it, please don't give it away on Twitter for Lena. <laughs> don't tell her. And I'm sure everyone knows. I will find out for myself. Okay. Any seen anything else interesting? No. Nope. You know, since the piss up, a few days, the last couple of days have been a bit of a blur. I know. I've listened. I get oh, it. Oh, Thursday morning, I was feeling it. I was annihilated. Yeah. I Even though I didn't drink, my brain was just going a million miles an hour, and I barely slept. And then I had my dog uh, like had to get up in the middle of the night. And so I got home at like 1230 or something, then went to bed, and then got up at 2, and then got up at 5. So I got like three hours sleep. Oh, jeez. So I hear you. I hear you. By the way, I went to Downton. The week before, the weekend before, Downton Abbey has a new movie. Do you not? Are you not a Downton person, Lena? Wait, they have a wait. Hold on. Yeah, There's they have another movie? movie. They have another movie. They have a second movie. Yeah. Oh, I just watched the first one not too long. Ago. Oh, so listen. I didn't like the first movie. Loved the show. Didn't like the first movie. This movie reviews were 
Uh, if you like Downton, you like the movie. I completely agree, but think it's even better than that. I don't want to set expectations too high because at the end of the day, it's a Downton movie. But it was really pleasantly. So if you're at all a fan of the show, go see the movie. But right. we should really talk about the movie that none of us have seen yet that we have to see immediately, which is Top Gun. Well, I thought you guys were going to go see it this week. Yeah, I did get around to it. Patrick, did you get around to it? Not yet. He was busy drinking. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I got I got a, I think it's uh, the reviews just keep getting great and great. People uh, saying that it's the first the first 10 minutes are the best 10 minutes of cinema since they were, you know, 16. how long is the movie like three hours? I have no idea. It's only the best 10 minutes. Come on. No, the, the, the first 10 <laughs> minutes scene is just unbelievable. They said the first is, 10 is, minutes. Is this like a consist of yeah. Tom Cruise doing his all yeah. kinds of his own? I have no idea. Then... But you know, one of the things I saw on Twitter, which I'm not sure of it. This is not a spoiler alert. But they never say who the enemy is. They just refer to them as the enemy the whole show. <laughs> That's what happens when you're too much of your Hollywood movies are made by the are financed by the Chinese. You can't have them. The and then enemy. I guess I don't know why you wouldn't do the Russians, but I don't know. <laughs> let's not get political. <laughs> I know. We just listen. Uh, who knows? Anyway, Patrick, do you have anything new and exciting to tell us? Oh, I, nope. I, mean, I have something to tell you. So I'm downtown. I'm working. <laughs> I'm headed out to go and come home to record for to meet Brent. I walk out the door, okay? I walk out of my building door. I look out the street. Guess who's walking by? Patrick. It's like it's like what? We just ran, randomly ran. Like into honestly, Patrick's in town for what? Three days a not, year? Not very. Not yeah. very long. Yeah. What are the chances? It's like destiny. So what'd you guys do? Did you guys Patrick, say hi? You are yeah, shook hands and then left. <laughs> well, yeah, because Patrick had to go. Had to go the other way. So, but it wasn't that funny. Yeah, it's just complete wow. blue. Small world. It is. It is a small world, and it's like Toronto's not like it's small, but it's not that small. Yeah, I was gonna say I'm like I don't know. You could have bumped into anybody. Yeah. I, don't, I have no idea. No. Ryan Gosling. I don't know. <laughs> that's, that's who you'd like to bump into. Yes. Anyway, see. Uh, oh, by the way, Lena, I'm shocked. Uh, uh, Elon Musk said something about uh, the economy being super bad. So I tweeted out something, you know, the, the very famous super bad scene where Michael Sarah sings these eyes. Yeah. I tweeted it out. I was just like flabbergasted. Ed Harrison, you know, who we've had on the show, mm-hmm. he, he, he'd never seen it. And all these other people are saying they'd never seen it. What the hell is with the world? Like super bad? Wait, they've never watched super bad? I know exactly how I felt. <gasps> He's going to watch it, though. He's going to watch it this weekend, and he's going to watch it with his son. I feel like Patrick, should... that goes for you, too. <laughs> Patrick's seen it, right? I, I, I have a confession. I've only actually watched, like, these half-an-hour scenes. Like, so, so I know some of the funniest scenes, but I've never actually done a uh, start-to-finish of the whole movie. Patrick. Amateur. He, yeah. <laughs> I've seen the, uh, the McLovin scenes and all that stuff like that. So, like, I, I already sort of... Uh, get you know the, the premise, but... That is but. Seth Rogen wrote it, and it's he wrote it in high school. It's like about Point Grey, like his high school in Vancouver that he grew up in. It's like what they imagine. Listen, you gotta watch it. One of the greatest, uh, like you know, teenage comedy movies that's ever existed. And uh, Pat- yeah. Patrick, uh, that's your that's your job. Yeah, we yeah. might not let you come on next week unless you've seen it. All right, okay, all right. You download it on Netflix or whatever. We'll make so a can... questionnaire for you, so you gotta, that's right. you gotta watch it. That's right. We'll we'll, we'll make a questionnaire. Um, <laughs> Or otherwise, it. I'm not allowed to record that on the show next week. Yeah, and yeah. Patrick's like, I'm not watching it. <laughs> You're like, I've, I got, a, I got an out. Um, Skip no. it down. So, Patrick, download it for your plane trip for wherever you're going, because you, I know you're always flying somewhere. So, download it so you can watch the whole thing. Yeah. On that note, everyone, go do it. It's a great movie. Uh, thanks again for everyone who came out to the, to the piss up. Really appreciate it. And thanks for everyone for listening, not just the people who came up to the piss up. Um, it's we really. Uh, it's really great to meet you all, meet a, a subset of you, and we really appreciate you spending some time with us. Thanks, everyone, and uh, have a great you. weekend, everyone. Take care. All right, cheers. Bye-bye.